Miss Ambassador, it's quite, uh, thanks a lot for talking to us. Um, of course, it's quite tough already for us to understand that it's already five years since the downing of since the MH17 tragedy. Uh, but the investigation is moving. Just recently, uh, the um, joint investigative team had announced that there are four suspects, three of them are Russian uh, citizens, one a Ukrainian, uh, there are names uh, like for instance Iher Hirkin who is very well known in Ukraine uh, and there is a call to cooperate, uh, but what to expect next because still the President Putin and the Russian uh, officials deny uh, all those um, charges and uh, it doesn't look like anything is going uh, with the cooperation. Mm -hmm. Well, um, as you mentioned, uh, on the 19th of June, um, we had a press conference in the Netherlands where the general prosecutor of the Netherlands indicated some first results of the criminal investigation by the joint investigation team. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, four people were then mentioned as uh, indicated, um, identified as suspects three of them uh, of Russian nationality and one of Ukrainian nationality. Now the criminal investigation will continue and uh, we have excellent uh, cooperation with the Ukrainian authorities, with the Prokuratura here in Kiev and um, we suspect that there will be more um, uh, people to be identified who are linked to this uh, tragedy in the later stage. Um, at the same time, uh, as a parallel track, we have the uh, state complaint, uh, which was uh, deposited by the Netherlands government in cooperation with the Australian government against Russia on the basis of the proof that the buck was transported from Russian territory uh, into Ukrainian territory. Um, so we hold Russia accountable for this and on the basis of these consultations, trilateral consultations between Australia, the Netherlands and Russia have started um, uh, in Vienna and these consultations uh, will continue. So on the basis of, um, of this proof, we have this so-called parallel track of the state complaint. We have the criminal investigation that will continue and we have the consultations separately. Uh, and what is expected from Russia? What does it mean, a cooperation? Because, and what would be the sign that something is moving? What are the first like, yeah. real demands? Well, when our minister was uh, visiting Moscow in April last year, he made very clear to uh, his uh, colleague, uh, Minister Lavrov, that we expect from Russia to comply with the uh, UN uh, Security Council Resolution 2166, in which uh, also Russia, by the way, um, committed itself to uh, cooperate with this investigation, with the criminal investigation. At the same time, we expect from Russia that they will stop discrediting the results of the uh, joint investigation team and we expect them also to cooperate with the legal requests which we have put forward to them. Uh, the joint investigation team up to now has concluded that the cooperation from Russia is not sufficient. So uh, in um, international fora, like for instance uh, uh, within the framework of the European Union, but also in New York, United Nations, in Vienna at the OECE, we also make clear that we um, I uh, think it's important that Russia will abide by this uh, resolution 2166. So we keep on pressing Russia to cooperate. There were not many news after the um, meeting of our Prime Minister Rutte with Vladimir Putin at the um, summit of G20. Mm -hmm. uh, there was like the case was described sensitive, uh, but still what could be the impact of that meeting and what are still the, the w what is discussed and I probably would ask to elaborate because for Ukrainians it's quite difficult to understand we understand the sensitivity but still like, the case is so clear there is investigations there are the results there are the names uh, and it's not the political case this is a tragedy where 298 people killed so there is a very strong position of the Netherlands and of Yes, in this case. yes, that's true. I mean, this, this tragedy has a, a serious emotional impact in our society. And like yourself and like the people in Ukraine, also in the Netherlands, uh, we are monitoring very closely uh, what is going on because everybody uh, wants to bring the perpetrators to justice 
to, uh, to the judge and to make sure that um, they will be perpetrated. Uh, now the issue is um, uh, what can the Netherlands do more than uh, this criminal investigation? Uh, we have, as you know, the Trias Politica, we have the uh, general prosecutor who is independent and who can then uh, uh, continue his investigation according to his own rules and his own norms. Um, uh, the government, in principle, uh, is acting independently from the general prosecutor, uh, but the government is, uh, as you know, as I indicated, um, following this uh, process in Vienna of the consultations on the state complaint. And um, probably you would also describe, you said you have a good cooperation with the Ukrainian side, but what's happening in this stage? For instance, recently there was the uh, news which still we try to figure out what's going on with Vladimir Tsemak. There is another guy who allegedly uh, was there on the um, place of the crash, on the site, uh, as well Bellingcat also had written about him, has provided some uh, visuals uh, that he had been in Snezhnoye. Uh, but uh, w what else is going on to the extent you can describe? You know, I'm not asking the details of the investigation, yeah. but Ukrainians don't probably know what exactly is happening and the investigation is still there. What I only can say is that the investigation team is working 24 hours, 7 days a week. It is uh, a very tough job uh, that uh, we have excellent cooperation in exchange of information with the Ukrainian authorities, with the Procuratura, uh, on this case of Mr. Vlodim Vladimir T, uh, as you mentioned him. Uh, I can only say that uh, According to our information, he was arrested by the SBU, just by the Ukrainian uh, uh, secret services, uh, on the basis of terrorism, terrorist acts in the uh, non-government controlled area. Um, uh, up to now, uh, I cannot uh, indicate any further connection with the MH17 with regard to Vladimir T. Uh, and uh, just generally, so how this work look like? You know, are there Dutch uh, investigators all the time here? Well, there is a field office uh, operating here uh, in the premises of the uh, Procuratura. And they are, uh, as I said, working very hard. Uh, I am not uh, uh, a continuous witness uh, of, their, of the details of their work. Uh, but uh, they have all our support and uh, uh, how they operate and how they work, uh, I cannot go into those details, that's confidential. That probably would be uh, good to know what in the end the, the families of the victims received, how they are, wh what's happening to them now, mm -hmm. what are their relations with the Dutch state, how yes. this... Yeah. Well, the family members of course are uh, kept uh, in the loop of the results and the progress of the investigation. For instance, when uh, last uh, week we had this uh, press conference uh, on the four suspects, the family members were informed before the press conference took place. Uh, the family members, of course, will be also present at the commemoration, which will take place uh, on the 17th, where we will have, as you may know, a monument uh, to commemorate uh, the tragedy. Uh, we have uh, planted uh, 298 trees, uh, each tree standing for one victim, and each tree carrying the plate with the name of one victim uh, and next to the trees we also have a monument, a steel monument, uh, commemorating uh, uh, this disaster. Uh, the uh, family members will be invited there, our Prime Minister will be there, our Minister of Foreign Affairs will be there, our Minister of Justice will be there, the Embassy representatives of the grieving nations will be there and they will all be in close contact with the family members. Um, so. Um, the contacts between uh, the government uh, and the family members um, go through a certain organization uh, which has been um, um, created uh, after the disaster and uh, they are uh, keeping in contact with the family members themselves. Still with the, the um, you know, the, the relations, you are ambassador in Ukraine and the rela relations between Ukraine and Russia isn't just uh, about the, and the Netherlands, just about the MH17. Uh, the Netherlands stand behind Ukraine in case of, uh, together with the European Union, on the cases of the European sanctions and, and other things. We recently had the summit where there was a joint kind of declaration. Um, and there, what we've seen that there could be some 
um, strengthening of the sanction policy if Russia doesn't give back the detained sol uh, sailors. There are 24 people who are war, uh, war prisoners. There are, there, are, there are issues mentioned by the political prisoners in Russia. Still, there is the feeling that there is very little uh, to do more. That kind of the package of the sanction is there to keep uh, what is there, you know, if there is no any, um, it's there, if there is no any movement. But if the things are getting worse, what else could be done? Because detaining, for instance, war, the, the, the case of the war, um, sailors showed that the things could get worse. Mm -hmm. Well, on this issue of the sailors, uh, very good that you mentioned this. Uh, also, uh, our minister has been very active in indicating to his colleague uh, Lavrov on several occasions that uh, we insist that they should be liberated immediately. Uh, this has been uh, an issue both in uh, New York at the United Nations level, as in Vienna at the OSCE level, as uh, well in Brussels at the uh, level of NATO and EU. So uh, wherever uh, EU uh, ministers uh, get together, uh, this uh, issue of the, of the sailors uh, imprisonment uh, in, in Moscow is uh, on the agenda. <coughs> um, I understand that there is some movement on this file uh, now at this moment uh, as we are talking um, uh, happening, uh, but I can't go into the details. And what it's hard to grasp for some of the Ukrainians that, that in the end, for instance, it's a different institution by the parliament, in the parliament assembly of uh, the Council of Europe, the Netherlands more or less voted three in favor, three against of uh, Russia. Uh, being back, uh, having the vote, uh, but without uh, completing, without uh, doing anything more or less uh, by default. Uh, and of course, there is a there are the countries, there are the country policies. But for a country which has this story of the tragedy of MH17, it's very hard for the Ukrainians to understand why the Netherlands, the the the, the Dutch delegation, would have this position, yes. which is not that clear. Yes, I, I understand your question. Um, well, when we talk about the Council of Europe, um, uh, we have to remember that this consists of two bodies. We have the Committee of Ministers and we have the Assembly. Uh, Mr. Lavrov was continuing to operate within the Committee of Ministers, while the um, Russian members in the Assembly were not present anymore. So this was a kind of a asymmetry, which was not very functional, uh, actually it was dysfunctional. Um, and at the same time, uh, we think that it's important that Russia uh, should abide by the rules and the norms of the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe stands for human rights and for individual freedom. And um, we think that it's better that we can talk with Russia on its obligations, if they are a member of the Assembly. Uh, obligations vis-à-vis -vis these um, uh, individual uh, freedoms and then when they are out of the assembly because if they are out we have no uh, impact on, on, their, on their position, less impact at least. So um, uh, that's one reason or actually two reasons why we think that's important to have Russia in rather than out. At the same time uh, and this is maybe a third reason um, uh, the um, uh, Russian citizens uh, have better access to the mechanisms of the Council of Europe, like the European Convention on Human Rights, if Russia is in. Uh, we would actually deprive uh, the Russian individual citizens of these mechanisms uh, if Russia would not be a member of the Assembly. Uh, I know that uh, the answer would be, uh, well, uh, Russia in the past never actually complied even when they were a member, so what's the use of having them inside? But we did some statistical studies and we think that at least more than half uh, uh, of the cases which were brought forward uh, in the framework of the Council of Europe were um, uh, considered by Russia to be valid cases. Um, so it does help to have Russia inside the uh, Council of Europe. And beside that, what do you then uh, say, because beside this argument uh, that it doesn't really help uh, to the Russian citizens, of course we, we hear already the comments how some of the Russian representatives are boasting that like we've done that. Uh, so it looks like more 
given an opportunity or you know th th that uh, the West is kind of pushing back. Uh, but what would you say to really the Ukrainians then? Uh, you can't speak probably for all the European nations. Uh, still they would ask, uh, you, you talked a bit about the sailors, but what, what would be at this moment the evidence and the proof that yes, the Netherlands are still there. They are like not trying considering they clear see what's happening with the war and the conflict and the black is black and white is white. But let me be very clear that the Netherlands uh, has uh, unwavering support for the uh, territorial integrity and the serenity of, of Ukraine. We think that uh, and like all EU, EU member states think and uh, like uh, many other countries in the world think that Crimea belongs to Ukraine, that Donbass belongs to Ukraine. And we make that clear at all occasions which are possible. We also think that Russia uh, um, uh, plays, uh, has played uh, a very negative role in the uh, bringing down of the uh, MH17 and that is why we have this criminal investigation. That is why we have the state complaint. And that is why we have in all international fora always uh, brought forward the idea that Russia should be condemned and should be asked to be uh, compliant with uh, UN Resolution 2166. That is actually our very active diplomacy on this against Russia. Uh, our relations with Russia are not business as usual. Um, how would you still describe the uh, Ukrainian-Dutch uh, relations and also especially after this referendum which has taken place some years already ago, but still a lot of Ukrainians remember that there is a part of the society in the Netherlands which somehow isn't really looking uh, welcoming into the Ukraine uh, closer EU cooperation? Yeah, well, um, it's true, I mean, uh, the referendum is a painful chapter in our bilateral relations. Uh, I have to maybe remind you that this referendum, uh, which had a negative result for Ukraine uh, with regard to the ratification of the association agreement, uh, was not purely against Ukraine as such. It was, um, I, have, I have stated this many times, it was also uh, a statement against Brussels, against the uh, Brussels bureaucracy, against the European bureaucracy and also maybe even against our government uh, at the time. So uh, it was a mix of sentiments which then uh, led to that uh, result. At the same time our Prime Minister found, uh, as you know, uh, a solution in Brussels with this annex uh, to, the, uh, to the Association Agreement uh, ratification text and at this moment uh, the Netherlands is welcoming and uh, also uh, supporting the ambition of Ukraine uh, to uh, its um, euro atlantic integration. Um, so the relations between the Netherlands and Ukraine, I would say, are developing uh, in a very positive way. Uh, the Netherlands is supporting in many fields also in the implementation of the association agreements. We continue to, to support Ukraine also in the implementation of the reforms, which are necessary as a, let's say, a complementary set chapter to this uh, association agreement and we think that uh, Ukraine is at this moment following the right way. So the, let's say the sentiments of the time, at the time of the referendum uh, are changing. We also see that in the results of for instance the European elections uh, recently of the European Parliament where the uh, populist parties uh, did not really uh, make a real, as was predicted by some, uh, um, uh, a real boost in their, in their results. How would you assess uh, the reforms and the process of the reforms? Because we went to this kind of communication when we know that it's expected the Ukraine do more, but some things are acknowledged, but then still Ukraine should do more in some of the issues. So where we are now, where uh, you expect Ukraine to do more, where it's not. Uh, also, we have a new era, we have one president. Well, I think... Uh, um Ukraine has come a long way on its uh, reform process. Uh, we all know that uh, in the last four years more reforms were initiated and some of them even implemented more than over the last 25 years before. Um, so I must say that um, uh, Ukraine in many fields like pensions, uh, healthcare, uh, education uh, has been doing quite well, also uh, decentralization. 
uh, which is a kind of a success formula in the, in the reforms. Um, at the same time, we all realize that uh, we are not yet there. Uh, there is still uh, a lot to be done, there is still a lot of homework. Uh, I just uh, returned from Toronto where I attended the uh, reform uh, conference on Ukraine and we all concluded that, um, let's say, in the field of rule of law, uh, there is still, uh, still, to be, still a lot to be done. We have, of course, the uh, legal infrastructure, uh, but now um, it comes down to the implementation and uh, it's, it's important to, uh, to, uh, to continue there. Uh, not only on the legal reform, but also, let's say, on the land reform. Uh, there's still uh, some homework to be done for Ukraine. Uh, we see that um, actually uh, there is some resistance. Uh, I can understand that resistance also. But uh, Ukraine is kind of um, um, imprisoned by its oligarchic structure, uh, to a certain extent still. And uh, Mr. Zelensky, the new president, has indicated that uh, well, he wants to change that. He wants to change the, uh, let's say, the influence of oligarchs on the political structure. And, um, well, we give him all the, let's say, uh, benefit of the doubt and all the credits he needs. We see a lot the uh, benefits of the doubt to the president of Zelensky uh, and things are expected from him. He promised a lot, although he says usually that he doesn't promise. Uh, but he, a lot has been... So what would be the sign that things are moving in the direction he promised, for instance, on the oligarchs. So what are these either laws or the actions uh, that it's not just the promises? And, and we are, we, we, not just Ukrainians, I guess everybody are very impatient, but with the reason. Of course, because uh, it's high time uh, for Ukraine now uh, to take this path of change and of reforms. Uh, well, one of the first priorities Mr. Zelensky has indicated is to, uh, to end the war in the Donbass. And uh, we see some first signs of, let's say, trials and errors uh, uh, as to how to, uh, to uh, adopt a different approach in the uh, Donbass conflict. Uh, talking about the format in Minsk, talking about uh, the disengagement in Stanislav Luganska. Um, and, uh, well, so we see that he takes this very seriously. Uh, then on, on, let's say, the economy and on the, on, the, on the economic structure and the oligarchy, he has indicated that he can be his own man, that he is not dependent upon any um, um, oligarch who might have been supporting him. Uh, I will not mention that name. Uh, and then um, economic reforms, he also in, uh, in Toronto underlined, uh, are at this moment the priority for his, uh, for his country. So you do not mention the name, but I know that we're talking to international, to a lot of foreign partners and a lot of people who are expecting uh, some movements on the you know, fighting oligarchic system. And we know that many people are asking the question about the ties of Mr. Zelensky with Mr. Kolomoisky, who is back to Ukraine, who mm -hmm. wasn't here. Uh, so, uh, what kind of assurances you get? Because I know this question is asked by, uh, I don't know, was it asked by you? Uh, you may say or not, uh, but uh, by, I, I know it was asked by many foreign partners. Yes. Um, well, uh, Mr. Kolomoisky is not the only oligarch uh, in Ukraine, there are many others, of course. Uh, Mr. Kolomoisky has supported uh, Mr. Zelensky uh, by, for instance, uh, giving his TV channel uh, available for the uh, serial of uh, Usluga Narodu. Uh, at the same time, uh, Mr. Zelensky had indicated quite clearly that he does not wish Mr. Kolomoisky to influence his political lines. Uh, we have to wait and see. I mean, he's been president now for how long? Uh, two, one month, two months? Uh, we have to give him time. Uh, we have to wait for the uh, parliamentary elections, of course, uh, which will take place in two weeks from now. Um, indications are that he might uh, uh, enter uh, Parliament with quite some substantial, let's say, number of, uh, of seats. Uh, we'll have to see uh, what kind of coalition will be needed, if a coalition will be needed, and how he can then uh, continue to operate. Uh, who will be the Prime Minister, uh, what will be his team, uh, and how they can really uh, implement uh, what they have indicated that they will implement. How do you generally uh, see the election process? Uh, well, the parliament elections. <laughs> maybe first the, the presidential elections. Uh, I mean, it has been approved that Ukraine is a real democracy. 
I mean, it's uh, in, in other countries uh, in the post-Soviet space, um, one could predict uh, quite easily uh, for uh, when there were presidential elections who will be the winner. Uh, this was not the case here. There were up to the very last moment. It was a uh, very tight schedule, and we didn't know who was going to be the president. So that's a real, uh, let's say, indication of democracy. It was also uh, uh, an election which took place very uh, free and free and, and, and fair circumstances, according to all the monitors that we have spoken to. Uh, not only the OSCE monitors, but also uh, monitors uh, from other bilateral participating countries. Um, so, um, uh, the parliamentary elections, uh, we are now in, on the eve of those elections. Uh, we have all trust and confidence that they will take place also in a free and fair context. Uh, we have no indications that um, uh, there's any fraud or any, let's say, irregularities at this moment. Um, it is a pity that we did not have time enough, uh, or that the government did not have time enough to change the electoral code. Uh, it will probably not happen before the elections as far as I can see it. Uh, because um, the uh, system of representational, uh, uh, proportional representation, of course, I would say reflects better uh, the democratic way of the country than the uh, system of the district, uh, district uh, uh, winner takes all system. Both in Toronto and uh, recently during the uh, EU <coughs> summit, President Zelensky uh, said that he's gonna to launch quite a big investment forum uh, in September already in Mariupol uh, to get the foreign investors on um, rebuilding the Donbas, creating the infrastructure and things like that. To what extent it's feasible? For many years, Ukrainian, for some years, Ukrainian uh, government works a lot to mm -hmm. get the Western investments and so far it's not very successful. Being very honest in absolute figures, it's not much. To what extent you can expect even Dutch companies to really consider this area, which is very close to the front line, and what should be done then? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, Toronto, you're right, was not only about reforms, it was also, let's say, a kind of an investment forum to see how Ukraine can attract investment. Because it's, uh, it's all in the economy, of course. I mean, the economy, if the economy is growing and developing uh, uh, positively, it would also help the reform process, it would also help political stability, and it would help also the macroeconomic stability of the country. So, uh, in that sense, it's important that investments will be attracted from, uh, from abroad. Um, for uh, this to be successful, uh, I think there should be a parallel track also on the reforms in the legal structure, that is to say, in the rule of law. Uh, investors uh, want to have accountability, transparency, predictability. They want to know that their investment is uh, secure, uh, that there will be no ratings, uh, and for all this, uh, the uh, reforms in the rule of law sector have to continue and they have to be uh, even strengthened and implemented. Uh, at the same time, land reforms, uh, as I already indicated, is important uh, for investments not only in the agriculture and the agro industry, but generally for investors, um, even for industrial companies. Mm -hmm.